Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, colleagues, I am Andrea Gianazzani, the president of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. And on behalf of the World Society, I would like to thank first Milan, who have uh, permitted the organization of this webinar on which, on a, with a fantastic title, which is the right uh, menopause hormone therapy for whom? As you know, this is uh, one of the most important topic in the actual uh, gynecology and not only gynecology, but also actual medicine. And uh, today we have uh, two speakers and uh, one of them will also chair the session. And it's my privilege to introduce the speaker. One is uh, Professor Rodney Barber. And Rodney is an obstetrician and gynecologist with a special interest in reproductive endocrinology and the menopause. He has, is retired from his obstetric practice and now heeds the menopause and menstrual disorder clinic at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. His uh, specialist training included the studies at the Royal North Shore Hospital, Sydney, and uh, the King College Hospital, and the Lister Hospital in London. He is the past president of the International Menopause Society and the Australasian Menopause Society. And uh, uh, also, he, is, uh, uh, he have known the uh, care of uh, uh, patient North Shore Private Hospital and is the past chair of uh, NSP Medical Advisory Committee and Division of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Neonatal Pediatrics. He is the current editor-in-chief of Climacteric and associate editor of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. The second speaker today comes from another part of the world, is Serge Rosenberg, and Serge is head of the Department of and Clinical Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and he is in charge of the menopause and osteoporosis unit at University Hospital St. Peter, and this is well recognized in the area of women's health in general. He has written a thesis of postmenopausal osteoporosis and published more than 200 articles in international peer reviewed journals on topics such as women's health, menopause, osteoporosis, and reproductive endocrinology. He is on the editorial board of several international journals and he has received several awards and grants for his research. He has been president of the European Menopause and Andropos Society and is one of the editors of Maturita. Then now, before leaving you, permit me to thank again Milan for the sensitivity and for the disponibility to organize uh, this webinar for all of us. Then thank you very much on behalf of all ISG board. And then, Serge, I would like to leave to you the chairmanship of this session and then the, to go on on this uh, fantastic webinar. Thank you all of you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for these nice words. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this session indeed. Okay, I have, uh, these are my uh, disclosures and conflict of interest. This is a sponsored session, but uh, I'm the sole per person responsible for the content of the presentation. Now, we all see patients that come from different uh, region horizons, different complaints, and many of our patients are different, but they're quite similar still. And uh, it is important to notice that all, although there are differences between women, they evolved quite importantly through time. And women of today share some aspects of women of yesterday and of the last century, but there have been dramatic changes changes about human rights and changes about women's rights. And I think that women's rights are human rights, of course, and I'll come to that later, but also changes luckily in life expectation. And if you see this chart, what you see, this is an UK chart, you see that uh, male in green and female in blue, and you see that women who were born in 1900s well, their life expectation was were about the age of the menopause, about 50 years of, or of age. And nowadays, they reach the age of 80 plus. 
which is quite important. What you see here on this slide is that there is still a big gap between countries. So the life expectation increased everywhere in the world, but there is a big gap, and this gap depends on wealth, on access to healthcare, and on education. That's why women's rights is quite important. But what you see also is that the age of menopause has not changed through time. It has remained quite constant. So it means that nowadays, a third of the life of women are spent after menopause. Now, the life expectation is not the same as the healthy life expectation. And what you see is that healthy life expectancy is not that much increased. It increases also, but not that much. And for instance, these are Belgium data. You see here the life expectancy in women, the life expectancy in men in blue. But you see that the healthy life expectancy of women and men are similar. So there is a gap. And what we want for our patients is not only an increase in life expectancy, but also an increase in life expectancy of healthy years. How does that relate to menopause? Well, it is quite important. And if you have a look at a menopause and the treatment of menopause through the ages and the time, in the 50s, 70 years ago, the menopause was treated with high dose estrogen and androgens. And this resulted in an increased risk of endometrium cancer that was noticed and observed in the 60s and 70s. Then we started treated women with still high doses of estrogen and progestins that were quite androgenic. In the 80s and 90s, people realized through randomized trials that HRT, it was called HRT, hormone replacement therapy, nowadays we would say menopause hormone replacement therapy or menopause hormone therapy, prevents osteoporosis. It also is beneficial for cardiovascular disease and ROT will come back on that issue because it's a very important issue and it has been a pendulum in time. It's not an indication for therapy today, but there are data showing that it is beneficial as, especially in women with an early menopause. In 2002, as you remember, most of you know, the WHI studies arrived and especially the first randomized trial comparing conjugate estrogen and medroxyprestron acetate, which is an androgenic progestin. And it was conducted in women that were about 10, 15 years after menopause, mostly asymptomatic women. And in this population, it didn't show to have more benefits than risk, but rather more risk than benefits. And that created a dramatic issue. It took 10 years and almost even more than 10 years to realize that actually, if we prescribe and administer menopause hormone therapy with low dose estrogen and progestins with a better profile, like diadrogesterone or progesterone, it entails a much lower risk and it should be preferred, the, the preferred regimen. So nowadays, today, in 2020, it's clear that in symptomatic women who are less than 60 years of age, with no contradictions, menopause homotherapy is associated with more benefits than risk, resulting in improved quality of life, which brings us back to healthy life and to a, a better uh, improvement of life. Now, I will immediately uh, give the word to Rod, who will present the first presentation uh, of this afternoon. Uh, thanks very much, Serge. Um, and thank you, Andrea, too, for uh, the very kind introduction. Thanks to ISGE for hosting this webinar and to Mylan for allowing us to take part. My task today is to talk to you about the benefits and risks of MHT, uh, as Serge has just explained to you. Um, these are my disclosures, uh, and as Serge had also mentioned, uh, this preparation to presentation today is entirely my own work. So let's just start by reminding ourselves of the global consensus statement on MHT. Uh, and the motherhood statements, if you like, really are that the principal indication for MHT use is to alleviate troublesome vasomotor symptoms. However, it should always be part 
of an overall strategy aimed at improving midlife women's health, the dose and the duration should be consistent with your treatment goals. So there is no mandatory stopping time. We should treat our patients for as long as they need to be treated. Estrogen only is appropriate for women who have had a hysterectomy, but if they still have their uterus, then they must receive a progestogen for endometrial protection. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. Current safety data do not support the use of MHT in breast cancer survivors and topical MHT is, should be your first line choice when symptoms are limited to the lower genital tract. So what are the benefits? First and foremost, alleviation of menopausal symptoms, um, but also alleviation of uh, genitourinary syndrome of the menopause or vulvovaginal atrophy and improvement in quality of life. And I'm not going to say too much more about that at all tonight. Certainly there's an improvement in bone density seen with the use of hormones and prevention of osteoporotic fractures. And as Serge has also mentioned, there is increasing evidence that estrogen, in particular estrogen, when used in the right woman at the right time, will provide some cardiovascular protection as well. But let's start with vasomotor symptoms. This data here is from a Cochrane systematic review conducted by Alastair McLennan quite some years ago, which shows that if you used HRT, as it was then called, uh, then the, the severity of menopausal symptoms or their frequency was re reduced by a little bit over 80%. Um, and I can tell you it is the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms. Of course, we should initiate therapy around about the time of the menopause. The time to treat is when the symptoms are at their worst, and that's usually around the time of the last period or a little bit before or a little bit after. But importantly, you should initiate therapy within the first 10 years. And remember, nothing treats vasomotor symptoms as effectively as hormone therapy. If we turn now to bones, there was uh, many years ago, quite a lot of data on high dose estrogen therapy showing an improvement in bone mineral density and not so much on fracture prevention. We now have quite a lot of data showing that lower doses of estrogen or estrogen combined with a progestogen is also effective in improving bone density. And you can see in this slide here that either one milligram of estradiol a day or two milligrams of estradiol a day combined with an appropriate dose of didrogesterone will result in improvement in bone density at the spine and at the hip. And you can see in the dark blue bars that over the two year period of this study, there was of course a loss of bone density amongst the placebo group. The best data we have probably on fracture prevention comes in fact from the Women's Health Initiative. And they were able to show uh, that menopausal hormone therapy prevents bone loss and will reduce the risk of fracture at the hip, at the spine and at other sites. Once again, you should initiate therapy in the women when they're younger and within 10 years of their last period. Now the magnitude of fracture reduction is somewhere between 23% and 34%. So it's very similar to the magnitude of benefit which we see with other bone sparing agents. And indeed, a recent US Endocrine Society statement drew attention to the fact that for women in their 50s, hormone therapy is at least as effective as alternative treatments. Um, and just to come back to cardiovascular disease, because I, Serge and I both agree this is so important, um, there is a lot of data to show that whatever age you are when you go through the menopause, your risk of heart disease is increased compared to women of the same age and risk profile as you who are still having periods. In other words, the menopause increases risk factors. And there are a number of reasons for that. There's a change in fat distribution. There's a subtle increase in blood pressure. There are adverse changes in lipids and in components of the metabolic syndrome, but also endothelial function worsens. And that leads to an increasing progression of atheroma in coronary arteries, first demonstrated in animal models by Tom Clarkson. 
We also know that if estrogens are delivered, again, close to the menopause, progression of that aroma can be inhibited. Unfortunately, we also know that some synthetic progestins tend to attenuate that beneficial effect of estrogen. So it is very important that we choose the right progestogen, and I'll go into that a little bit in a short while. There is, of course, any number of uh, massive studies looking at the relationship between HRT and MHT and coronary heart disease. But just to share one with you, I thought I'd choose the Cochrane Review conducted by Henry Boardman in 2015. And you can see circled that for women who commenced hormone therapy within 10 years of their last period, there was a significant reduction in all-cause mortality and in coronary heart disease. In contrast, if women started hormone therapy more than 10 years from their menopause, there was no change whatsoever in all-cause mortality or coronary heart disease. But in both of those groups, because oral therapy was a major component of the analysis, there was an increase in thromboembolic risk. There was no change in the risk of stroke for women who commenced hormone therapy, whether it be oral or not, within 10 years of their last period. And so the global consensus statement and the IMS recommendations on heart disease and hormone therapy today are that in women under the age of 60, recently menopausal, and with no evidence of pre-existing cardiovascular disease, estrogen alone therapy will reduce coronary heart disease and all-cause mortality. The data on continuous combined therapy is less robust, but that's probably because of the choice of synthetic progestins in many of the studies. And data on other combined regimens do, do suggest cardioprotection. The most recent Cochrane analysis and other meta-analyses, and indeed the WHI 13 year results, all show a consistent reduction in all-cause mortality. But because of thromboembolic risk associated with oral therapy, MHT is not recommended overall solely for the primary prevention of coronary heart disease. And I would agree with Serge that the one exception to that rule should be women with POI. So what about the risks? There are short-term and long-term risks, and the short-term risks are principally breast tenderness, bloating, and PV bleeding. And these are related to the dose of estrogen and to the regimen chosen. So in contrast to the doses of hormones we used prior to WHI, we would now recommend that you start in lower doses. And this uh, data here refers to a study comparing one milligram and half a milligram of estradiol with continuous diprogesterone uh, and with placebo for the first three months of the 13 month trial. And you can see that for the women who used the higher dose, there was more spotting and bleeding, particularly in the first six months. Of course, after a year, they're the same. But in order to minimize anxiety on the part of our patients and concern about bleeding, as far as we're concerned, an unnecessary intervention, it's wise to start with a low dose. But remember, if you do start with a low dose, it may take longer for the symptoms to be alleviated. And you can see with this study that for women who used one or two milligrams of estradiol, there was statistically significant reduction in flushes within four weeks. But for the women who used half a milligram a day, it took eight weeks. And it really took 12 weeks before maximum benefits were achieved. So when we start our patients, we should start on low dose and we should warn them that it will take some time for them to achieve maximum symptom relief. And what about the long-term risks? Well, thromboembolic disease and a risk of cancer are the two main issues. And these again can be influenced by the dose of hormone used, by the duration of therapy, and particularly again, by the choice of progestogen. And if we look at thromboembolic disease, then the background risk of VTE is about one or two per 1,000 women per year in non-Asian populations. It's less in Asian populations. If MHT is initiated orally, then the risk is increased by about one or two extra cases 
per thousand women per year. And it's rare in low risk women until the age of 60. The incidence is always highest in the first year of oral treatment. And that's because we're unmasking previously unidentified thrombophilias. And it's increased by the use of some progestogens. But importantly, there's no increased risk of VTE with the use of transdermal estrogen. So if you choose to use an estrogen patch or an estrogen gel, you will not increase the underlying thromboembolic risk of that patient, whether she is normal, whether she is overweight, or whether she has a thrombophilia. VTE will not be increased beyond baseline with transdermal therapy. And when a progestogen is required, it's wise to use a neutral progestogen such as progesterone or diprogesterone. And of course, a progestogen is essential for any woman who has a uterus. And the best evidence I can give you of that is from the PEPI study all the way back in 1996, which was run for three years. And there was amongst this study, a group of women who were given estrogen only, even though they had a uterus. And almost two thirds of those women developed endometrial hyperplasia over the three years of the study. Thankfully, none developed cancer, but 11.8% developed atypical endometrial hyperplasia, which as you know, is pre-malignant. In contrast to that, the women who used estrogen combined with either progesterone or a progestin had no increase in any form of endometrial hyperplasia beyond that seen with a placebo. But you must use the right progestogen and you must use the right dose and you must use the right duration of time. And we believe today in the 21st century that the right progestogen for almost all women will be a neutral progestogen such as micronized progesterone or diprogesterone, either cyclically for 12 to 14 days a month, particularly in the perimenopause or continuous daily in postmenopausal women. And I've shown you the doses there on this slide. And finally, breast cancer, because this is the thing that worries most of our patients. I wanted to start by showing you this data, which reflects the risk of breast cancer in British women aged 50 to 59 over five years. And we're looking at the rate, the number of women who will get breast cancer per 1,000 over five years. And for the general population, that'll be 23 women. If they use the hormones that were used in the Women's Health Initiative, there will be four more cases, four more per thousand over five years. If they use estrogen alone, there'll be four less. If they have two glasses of an alcoholic drink each day, there'll be five more, three more if they smoke. If they're overweight or obese, the risk doubles. And if they exercise for two and a half hours a week, there's about a 50% reduction in their risk. So really, the problem for our population of women is not so much the hormones that they may or may not take, it's their lifestyle. And if we could persuade women, and men for that matter, to exercise more, to watch their weight, to achieve a healthy weight and lifestyle, then many of the diseases of aging could be dramatically reduced. But nevertheless, we don't want anyone to get cancer. And the Women's Health Initiative data initially showed these results for combined therapy, where there was an increase in the risk of breast cancer for women who used Premarin and Provera. However, with long-term analysis, the women who used estrogen alone were shown initially to have no increased risk at all. With long-term follow-up, that became statistically significantly reduced. And use of estrogen alone was associated with a lower incidence of breast cancer, fewer deaths from breast cancer, and lower all-cause mortality. Whereas the combined therapy did, as I said, show an increased risk, albeit only eight per 10,000 women per year, and only after five years of treatment. So the question we had to ask was, does this apply to all progestogens? And I think the answer is no, because we have data from two large European observational studies. First, the Finnish cohort study, which looked at 50,000 women over 50 years of age 
who took hormone therapy for five years or more. And you can see in the brown bar here that for women who use estradiol and didrogesterone, there was no increase in breast cancer risk whatsoever over that period of time. If they used um, estrogen with MPA or with norethisterone, their risk was increased. More indeed than was seen in the Women's Health Initiative, but that's probably because observational studies tend to overestimate treatment effects. There's also data from a large French study called E3N, which uh, included 80,000 women and were followed for 8.1 years. And once again, for women who use estrogen and progesterone alone or estrogen with didrogesterone, risk was not increased. It was for women who used synthetic progestogens, again, by more than we saw in the Women's Health Initiative. And of course, last year, we had the publication in The Lancet from the collaborative group, group on hormone factors in breast cancer. And this attracted a lot of attention because it was large and well publicized. It included 108,000 women who developed breast cancer. It was all observational. There was no WHI data, nor was there E3N data included. This study showed no difference in the relative risk between users of oral conjugated estrogens or estradiol. There was very little evidence on transdermal estrogen. In fact, most of this data relates to hormone therapy used prior to the Women's Health Initiative, and most of it, although it is said to be a global study, actually comes from UK data. These are the findings. For women who used hormones for one to four years, the risk of breast cancer for those who used combined therapy was increased, the relative risk being 1.6. For women who used estrogen only, the relative risk was increased, it was 1.17. If they used it for between five and 14 years, the risk was 2.08 for combined therapy and 1.33 for estrogen only therapy. But remember what I said, observational studies tend to overestimate the treatment effect because we just cannot identify all the possible confounders. And indeed, if we look at Joanne Manson's 2013 publication, looking at long-term uh, risk, the figures are less. For the combined therapy users, the hazard ratio was 1.24, significantly less than those seen in the observational study. And the risk of breast cancer with estrogen only was again not increased with a hazard ratio of 0.79. Most importantly, this study doesn't relate to MHT regimens, which are currently recommended. It has limited data on regimens using estrogen with micronized progesterone or didrogesterone, and it makes no attempt <clears throat> to balance either age specific or overall risks and benefits that I've tried to point out to you today of MHT. There is a little bit of data on femiston, which is didrogesterone and estradiol, but you can see the numbers that were used were very small, 65, 162, or 26 out of 108,000. But even then, that data showed no increased risk of breast cancer for women who used femiston for five years, and a small increase in risk, again, probably overstated for women who used therapy for longer periods of time. And finally, you may think you've seen this slide before, but in fact, this is the latest publication from WHI, which was only released a couple of months ago. And you can see that for women who used estrogen and had undergone a prior hysterectomy, there was a lower risk of breast cancer, which was statistically significant and a lower risk of breast cancer mortality. For women who used estrogen plus MPA and had an intact uterus, there was indeed a significant increase in the risk of breast cancer, but there was still no increased difference in annualized breast cancer mortality. So I think the data is very persuasive. We have a choice, my friends. We can continue to prescribe in the way HRT was prescribed last century, or we can minimize any small risks associated with MHT by individualizing our treatment, by using the lowest effective dose, by using body identical estrogens and progestogens, by selecting the right hormones in the right regimen for the right women 
and by reviewing regularly and listening to our patients. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rod. It was a very much, it was an excellent presentation. And we will have a Q&A after uh, the second uh, presentation, which is a presentation that I will start now. Okay. So uh, finding the right menopause hormone therapy for the right, for the right need and subgroups. That's the issue. It's quite a difficult issue because there are so many patients, as we said before. Uh, I present my disclosures already. So the learning objectives today, uh, after what just told us, which is quite important uh, theoretical uh, issue, we need to understand the different risk profiles associated with different regimens. The impact of low estrogen here already quite showed that. And the importance of a progesterone component also, he already showed it, but I will illustrate it even a little bit more with a vignette. So I present to you a patient of mine, which is Mrs. Z. She's 44 years old. She has two children, she's single. During the last two years, she has had several irregular cycles and her last menstruation occurred one year ago. So we can say that she's menopause. Her, she had a, a blood analysis that was checked several times and it's not necessarily to do it several times, but it showed high FSH and a low estradiol. Now, she complains about seven to 10 hot flushes a day and also night sweats. So what happens is that in the morning, she cannot concentrate, she cannot work because she doesn't sleep well. So she has really a quality of life that was that is decreased. She realizes that, but she did nothing about it because she was afraid, like Rod just said before, she's afraid of breast cancer. And her mother had her had a breast cancer when she, her mother was 67. So it puzzled her. She had a menarche at age 13. She has no particular medical history for the rest, but she smokes 15 cigarettes a day, which is not the ideal, as you know. She weighs 58 kilos, one meets 67, which is normal, a normal BMI. She has a normal blood pressure also. She had an, a biology that was checked. Her cholesterol is average high, it's a little bit high, 200 milligram percent, and LDL is also a little bit high. Her pap test was normal. She had a mammography that was normal, a BIRETS A, and she had a bone density scan that was measured, although not everyone would do that, but because she had a menopause at a rather early age, it was checked. And she had a Z score because before 50, we speak about Z scores and not T scores of minus 2.5 at the spine, showing that she's on the edge of osteoporosis, as you can see. So to treat or not to treat, that is the question. So I will think everyone, would you treat her? I can't ask you to raise your hands because I don't see your hands, but do it just to, to move. Those who would treat her, those who don't treat, so those who don't know. But what are the indications for these patients? What are the, does she have a contraindication? And if we decide to treat her, how should we treat her? These are the questions. Are there indications? Well, obviously she suffers from severe vasomotor symptoms. We saw that. And it has a negative impact on her life quality, quality of life, on her sleep, on her functional ability, on her work. So it's important. Now we know that among candidates for menopause homotherapy for vasomotor symptoms, and Rod just showed you that the best treatment is hormone therapy for that, but only one in four will seek treatment. Only 25% seeks treatment. Why is that? Essentially because many women are afraid. Now, she also has some osteopenia, limit osteoporosis, and this is a, these are the data of the WHI. On the upper screen, it's the CA plus MPA trial, the randomized trial, on the lower bottom, it's CA only, and it's expressed for 1,000 women aged between 50 and 59, which is the age range that interests us. These are the patients that you will see in your daily clinical practice. And what you can see is that if you prescribe to these women, 
menopause hormone therapy, whether it is estrogen only or estrogen and MPA, you reduce the risk of fractures. For 1,000 women treated for five years, you reduce it by about 10 fractures uh, in total. So these are the indications. As Rod said before, in women who are young, and this patient is 44, and before 45, we know that also when you prescribe menopause hormone therapy, you reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. And if you don't do that, we know that these women have an increased risk of coronary heart disease. It's true that prevention of coronary heart disease is not an indication nowadays for menopause hormone therapy, generally speaking, except in POI, but also the premature ovarian insufficiency before 40. But we know also that before 45, this is a group, it's a group with an increased risk. So I think it, we should consider it as maybe something to put in the balance, although it's not an indication. That's why I put that as a slide. It's not an indication and prevention of dementia is not an indication either for the moment. Does this woman has a contraindication? At least she thinks so because she believes she has a contraindication because of her mother and her brother, her mother who had a breast cancer, but she forgets about the cigarettes and the cigarettes are probably much more important for her life. Actually, because she smokes, she increases her risk of osteoporosis, her risk of cardiovascular disease, and her risk of breast cancer. So don't forget that the menopause is an opportunity to correct risk factors. And it's very important that we have to do that. It is our duty. Now, if we look at the other aspect, she has a cholesterol that's a little high also. So maybe she has an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And maybe she has an increased risk of osteoporosis and of breast cancer. How can we deal with that? For osteoporosis, if she was be behind, if she was more than 50, but she's not, you could use FRAX model. FRAX model is not validated before 50, but it gives you an, an, an indication of the risk. But for cardiovascular, you can use, for instance, there are several calculators. This is one of them. And you can put in this calculator, several items of your clinical items of this patient, which I did, and I calculated, and I calculated her risk is a risk at five years of 4.57% of having to dealing with a, a, a major risk factor. Sorry, it's a 10 years for cardiovascular disease, it's a 10 year risk. So it's almost a 5% risk, but it's a little bit less of dealing with a major cardiovascular risk. You can also show to your patient what happens if she starts smoking, how her risk decreases. So you can use it also to, to teach your patient. Now, if the risk is less than 5%, you are, for most uh, authorities, for most scientific uh, societies, would consider that your risk is, is not increased and that you can prescribe menopause hormone therapy to that patient. If she had a higher risk, between five and 10%, you should be cautious and balance the risks. We spoke about contraindication. What about her, the fact that her mother had a breast cancer? It's true that it increases a little bit the risk factor as indicated, as shown in this slide. You see here in this slide that there is a small increase. You can also use a, a calculator, but actually just to tell you that most studies, the WHI, when in the estrogen only arm, the WHI in the EPT estrogen progesterone arm, or the Iowa uh, study showed that actually, yes, if you have a, a first degree history, you increase risk. But whether you take a placebo or whether you take no treatment in an observational study, or whether you treat, treat an active regimen, there is no major increase in risk. Uh, it's not an additive risk with a personal history. And I will show you that in two more slides. This is just to remind you that, yes, a first relative is a relative risk about of three. You can use a calculator like I did for the cardiovascular disease. You can use, there are several calculators. But this is the Tyro Suzik Ibis risk calculator. It's free on the internet. You can type that. And I did just 
I put all the, the, the clinical data of, the, of these patients that I gave to you, and you see that she doesn't increase her risk, actually, and she has a low risk, so you feel safe with menopause hormone therapy for these patients. Now, if I change her mammography, and I say that the mammography was not dense, but I take a very dense mammography instead, and I modify that parameter, and a high, a very dense mammography is an increased risk factor, much more important than the first degree. It increased by factor five, six, the risk of breast cancer. You can do that, and you will see in the same using the same calculator that her risk is still acceptable. It's about 3.1% on five years, but you are in the intermediate uh, zone, and so you should be cautious and you should balance again the risk. So this is a way you can use when it's not that evidence to evaluate the risk of individual patients. Now, should we treat these patients? I think so, yes, because she has a severe indication. She, she suffers quite a lot from her symptoms. She has osteopenia. And as you say, you show, I showed you, her cardiovascular risk and her breast cancer risk are not that high. Now, how should we treat her? I think with a low dose estrogen, and it's often sufficient to treat, to relieve the symptoms. It takes more time, like Rod uh, just showed you. You have to warn your patient that we, it, symptoms will not go away after a few days. It might take a few weeks. And um, if you, you give a low dose estrogen, it is sufficient for osteoporosis prevention, as it was shown, but also it reduces the risk of deep venous thrombosis and the risk of stroke. And these are important issues. Because you need to add also progesterone in women who still have a uterus, as Rod just told you, you have to choose a progesterone with the safest profile. So that would be progesterone and hydrogesterone rather than a synthetic androgenic progestin. Why is that? because the actions are quite different. I can give a lecture for one hour about that, but just to show you that the, if you look at metroxyprogesterone acetate or NETA, they will uh, have an action on glucocoid corrected receptor that is quite different for progesterone, for instance. So the, the, the action on the cell, the genomic and non-genomic actions are very different. And just to illustrate that, that translates in different risk of cardiovascular disease, different risk of thrombosis, and different risks of breast cancer risks also. This is data Rod just showed, and he mentioned the data of Clarkson of that group. Indeed, you can induce in a model of monkey atherosclerosis. And if you castrate these monkeys, you increase the atherosclerosis. But if you provide estrogen, estradiol, or estradiol and progesterone, you will reduce the risk of atherosclerosis in these monkeys. But if you give them conjugate estrogen and MPA, which is an androgenic progestin, you don't reduce the risk of atherosclerosis anymore. So you lost, you have a, you lost this beneficial effect of menopausal hormone therapy. This is one example. This is data in women in a large, very it's a recent study, finished study again, in a huge data bank, and where you see that the risk of thrombosis providing estradiol in a low dose, less than one milligram, and diadorosterone is not the same at all. It doesn't increase the risk of thrombosis, while estradiol on a high dose, more than one milligram, with combined with NETA, norotesterone, increases the risk of thrombosis. This is another aspect. And the last aspect, and again, this is a little overlapping with what Raj showed you. He, sh he mentioned the two studies about the difference but of, on breast cancer with progesterone and uh, diadrosterone compared with androgenic progestins. Here are five different studies that didn't report an increased risk of breast cancer as compared to an increased risk that was reported when providing, administrating 
estradiol with an androgenic progesterone like MPA or NETA. So to conclude, our patient, Mr. Z, can be treated with menopause hormone therapy. We would start with a sequential estrogen progestin, probably because she's young, and probably after a certain time, switch to a continuous one. And we'd start with a low dose estrogen and a progestin that is rather dihydrogesterone or progesterone. My talk take home messages for today. Each patient is different. We have to respect that. The menopause in the pod is a real opportunity for correcting risk factors. In this case, it was smoking. It might be drinking. It might be overeating. It might be sedentarity. Please correct these risk factors. It's important for our patients. The indication for menopause hormone therapy should be discussed on an individual base, balancing the risk and benefit for our individual patient. And for most patients that are less than 60 or less than 10 years after menopause, menopause hormone therapy is indicated if they are symptomatic or if they have osteoporosis. In that case, favor a regimen with a low risk profile because quality of life matters. Thank you very much. I think we have to go to the Q&A now. And I try to find the Q&A. Rod, do you see the questions also? And if you want to take some? Um, I've got a few questions, Serge. Um, the first one I've got was, uh, when is the best moment to initiate MHT? Uh, would you do it when the symptoms start or wait until they're well established? In other words, should we be proactive or should we uh, wait until they get really bad? Well, the answer is, first of all, you must talk to your patient about that and see what she wants to do. And as Serge has just shown you, evaluate risks and benefits. But as a general rule, I would certainly advocate starting treatment when the symptoms are bothersome. There's absolutely no point in waiting longer and longer. I agree. Um, and then yes. I've got another one which says, it seems clear that there are differences concerning safety between micronized progesterone, didrogesterone and the synthetic ones. What's the difference between micronized progesterone and didrogesterone regarding oral intake? Well, they're both well absorbed orally. Uh, you only have to look at the packets to see that uh, the daily dose of progesterone is 100 milligrams a day and didrogesterone is usually about five milligrams or two and a half milligrams a day. So the way that didrogesterone has been modified has facilitated oral absorption, but both are well absorbed orally, both bind strongly to progesterone receptors and both have been shown to provide endometrial protection. I would add, if I can, but this is not randomized data. So it's, you know, you have different levels of expertise of, of, of evidence. And no, what I'm going to say is of a very low level of evidence, because it's my, my, my gut feeling, but maybe, and, and if you don't agree, you just tell me. But I have the impression that progesterone, you have to take really at night, because uh, some patients and many patients feel, feel a little bit uh, sleepy. Uh, because of that. And so I think that the tolerance, the tolerance to didrosterone is a little bit better to, than to, to progesterone. That's one thing. And there is also one study, uh, if I recall well, that showed uh, a lower risk for endometrial hyperplasia with didrosterone than with progesterone. That it's a, it's a study of the E3N group also, the French group yeah. that published that. That's to, 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 to complete uh, this question. Yeah, I agree with you. Certainly progesterone can cause quite a bit of sedation. So it right. all certainly should be taken at night and not immediately after a meal or you'll fall asleep before you've finished eating. Yeah. So before bed is the best time to take it. We have plenty of questions. I think we have, I see that we have 30 questions or something like that or more that's coming in. Um, someone, okay. You, Rod, do you, do you see the questions also? We can take some of the questions. Um, um, I've got another one saying, what's your recommendation for initiating MHT in a perimenopausal woman suffering from severe hot flushes? <clears throat> and I think once again, 
<clears throat> as a rule, I would initiate therapy in a sequential manner uh, to try and minimize unnecessary breakthrough bleeding. Start with a low dose of estrogen to see if you can achieve symptom relief with that dose and combine that with a sequential didrogesterone or progesterone on a monthly cyclical basis. Of course, there may be other choices that you could discuss with your patient, including, for example, uh, the birth control pill, if it's not contraindicated or issues around contraception, but in terms of MHT then sequential low dose, I think. Uh, there is a question also about young patients with POI here, I see. So there are a few <laughs> questions about POI. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to warn that we are maybe out of label. I'm not, uh, so I say yes, it, probably. but um, it's, a, it's, an important, it's an important issue because these, these are dramatic issues for these patients. They, they, they suffer, especially if they don't have children also. Uh, of course, and of course, you have to counsel these patients about uh, egg donation. You have to counsel about ad ad adoption, but you have to constantly to provide psychological help to these patients. Of course, they need a lot of help and reassurance also about the fact that they need menopause hormone therapy. And I would prescribe to these patients menopause hormone therapy, and probably in this case they need higher doses. Uh, then, yeah. then uh, the, this is an exception, and these these patients need sometimes higher doses because you really want to uh, to be sure that the bone uh, is fine, and probably so. Probably they need one or two milligrams of estradiol uh, and ten milligrams of uh, dadrosterone. Would you agree for that? Yes, I agree, one hundred percent. That's right. They often need higher doses to alleviate the symptoms, and I think, Serge, they need higher doses to protect their bones too. Yes, yes, I agree. <clears throat> so uh, there was something, another question that arrived, which is in the opposite uh, about about a patient uh, who doesn't want to stop her medication while she's very old. If I understood the question well. Uh, she's, she must be in her 70s or even more, more than 75 and uh, she deal, still wants to continue with her, her menopause hormone therapy. How do you deal with that, Rod? <laughs> <laughs> well, Serge, this, uh, this goes back to what I said in my talk about you have to look after these patients for as long as they need their treatment. I guess uh, if she was in her 70s, first of all, I think you must review the need to continue treatment on an annual basis. Um, and the only way you can do that is by discussing it with your patient and seeing if she can get away with a slightly lower dose or indeed stop it altogether. As she yeah. gets older, her risk of thromboembolic disease is going to go up. So I'd be switching her probably to transdermal therapy rather than oral therapy, certainly by the time she was in her 70s. Uh, but I don't think on the basis of uh, continuing symptoms, we have a right to just stop it and tell her to go away. We have to work out the safest way to treat her. Yeah, we, we, I agree with you. We negotiate sometimes with the patients, yeah. uh, depending on her risk factors also. And if she's, she's a, a patient, she's slim, she golfs uh, every day, uh, she doesn't smoke, she has no risk factors, um, of course, we will accept it more easily that she continues her medication. Yeah, that's right. I would try to taper. I would try to taper the medication and to, to reduce the medication. But sometimes in some patients, uh, we need to, if she has really contraindication, she has a real risk factor for, for stroke or something like that, then of course you or, or deep venous thrombosis, yeah. then of course you have to, to make sure that she understands the risk that she's taking in it and that she should yes, stop indeed. the medication. So it's, this is real clinic and this is out of label, of course, again, because but this is real clinic and I understand that you ask a question. Um, we have I a see question. question here that says in developing countries where you can't, women can't afford MHT, what's the alternative? Um, that's very sad. I think uh, going back to what you said, Serge, which I think, um, might have been originally attributed to Helen Reddy. Women's rights are human rights and human yes. rights are women's rights. And so this is a case where we must lobby the government to try and make good, helpful, effective treatments available to all women in all parts of the world. 
I agree, we should lobby for, for reproductive health. And this is part of reproductive Absolutely. health. Uh, and it goes, it starts with contraception and it goes to uh, have a child when you want it and not when you don't want it. And it ends with this also. I think that's, that's very important. I agree yeah. with you. That was my message, you understood it well. Um, okay, let's have, let's, there's a question about the risk of thrombosis in Caucasian versus Asian patients, because you mentioned that, Rod. Do you want to, do you have any idea about that? Um, the risk is less in Asian patients uh, and significantly less, um, most likely because they haven't, uh, <clears throat> they're not carriers of the thrombophilias that yeah. are more common well, in European communities. Yeah. That's why factor five Leiden, yeah, for instance, right. is, is, comes from Netherlands, Indeed. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay. Um, I have a patient 48 with a BMI of 51 and no other yeah. risk factors. Will you avoid menopause hormone therapy? Difficult question. What do you think about that? I think that's very difficult because uh, she's at in hugely increased risk of metabolic disease, yes. but she's also at increased risk of thromboembolic disease. Oh too. yes, oh yes. So she'd have so and endometrial cancer. Yeah, and endometrial cancer indeed. So she'd have to have transdermal therapy if she had anything. I'd certainly be trying to get her uh, metabolic health under control first. Um, but remember, if we give her transdermal therapy, that's going to help to reduce her insulin resistance a bit. It'll have beneficial effects on her lipids as well. So there's some argument in favor of using it, but she would have to understand that there are significant underlying risks associated with her BMI. I think that if she has such a BMI, probably the question is also, would she not be need an operation or would she yes, not probably. need a, a, a bypass or uh, because she, she increases her risk. If you put her in a cardiovascular risk calculator, unfortunately, probably uh, her, the risk of dying soon is, is, is quite increased, high, very, yeah. very high. I didn't do it, but, but I suggest to do that and to discuss it and to see what are the reasons. Is there a genetic reason? Because nowadays we find genetic uh, reasons for very high BMIs or whether it's due to the fact that she, she has been abused in her childhood or something like that. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. I think about the book of Roxane Gay, Hunger, and that you should, every physician should read, but this is behind the, the subject. Uh, there is a question about prescribing estradiol with a serum to avoid the progesterone. Well, I would not do that because it has been studied actually. And some people have tried that and you increase the risk of hyperplasia uh, quite a lot. So it, that's, that, that has been can, uh, abundant. So we are out of label totally and don't do it. Um, I can see one here that says, can you give transdermal HRT to a woman with factor V laden? Um, there is published data to show that if you use transdermal therapy, the risk is not increased beyond the background risk. But if you give oral therapy, it's about four times higher. So the answer to that should be yes, but I would use transdermal. And low dose. Yeah, and low dose, absolutely. Yes. And if needed, progesterone, diversterone or, or progesterone. Because yeah, there are yeah. data showing that, as we show, that yes. the thrombotic risk is not the same. Okay. Okay. Um, Ibis calculator, if moderate risk, 17 to 30% at 10 year, will you not offer hormone replacement therapy? Well, if, uh, so if I understand the question well, for instance, if you have a patient with a hyperplasia with atypia, a biopsy, previous bi biopsy, for instance, and this is a patient that has a very increased risk of breast cancer, I would not prescribe hormone therapy to these patients. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is indeed, uh, although there are no data, real data, but I will not do that because we know from studies in breast cancer survivors that the risk of uh, recurrence uh, is increased 
a network has been, has been shown in at least two out of three randomized trials, the HABITS trial and the LIBERATE trial. The LIBERATE trial was about Tibolone. It has been shown that, especially in those patients who had receptor, hormone receptor positive for estrogen, that if you provide hormone therapy to these patients, you increase the risk of recurrence. Um, what is the minimum dose of estrogen required to prevent osteoporosis and to treat osteoporosis? I think it's so. You want to? No, you can have that. That's your thing. Okay. Well, there are two ways to see that. Um, if you look at, at, at no, three ways. Uh, very small doses we know have an effect already. And we know that from, uh, first of all, one observational study that came from South California, from the group of Cummings, where they showed that those women with endogenous levels of estradiol that were less than 10 picogram per ml, very low, had an increased risk of osteoporosis as compared to an untreated women with endogenous estradiol that was above that level. That is one, one aspect. The second aspect is we know also from aromatase inhibitors that when you suppress totally the estrogen, you increase the, the bone loss dramatically. And from those range studies on uh, biomarkers, uh, crosslinks, and uh, for instance, uh, you can do, you can check the turn of bone turnover with biomarkers, and you can see that uh, already with low dose estradiol, uh, as low as uh, 0.5 milligram or 0.25 milligram even, you will reduce the bone loss in most patients. It doesn't mean that you will have the full effect or the same effect as a, as a one milligram or two milligram, but with 0.5 milligram, we are safe, clearly. So in the clinical practice, yeah. I will go to 0.5 milligram. Do we have still some time? Because I'm, I'm thinking we are running. Uh, I think we may be asked. <clears throat> We'd be asked to stop because we can we can speak for hours, like that. <laughs> I, I, I I know my, my continue. friend. Please continue. Okay. Uh, okay, we continue. Okay. Right up. And we take the other questions. What questions do you see? How long after being on sequential should you change to continuous? Well. We usually say once a woman is postmenopausal. So if she was, for example, to have been on a sequential therapy for a period of say six months, uh, having been perimenopausal at the time she commenced, and if her only bleeds were the withdrawal bleeds, which she had on sequential therapy, I would certainly be inclined to switch her over to continuous combined therapy if that's what she wanted. Some women will prefer to be on sequential yeah. therapy for a longer time. Yeah, it's, it's a cultural aspect. Most Caucasian women in Belgium would say, please, I don't want to bleed. Yep. But occasionally, some women will say, I prefer have menstruation and be able to tell my partner I have menstruations for, yes. for various yes. reasons. Yes, that's right. That's true. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to apologize to those who ask questions because we will not be able to answer all the questions. We have more than 65 questions already. So, uh, yeah. we will, so apologies if we don't answer your question. Uh, you may feel frustration, but I, please, voila. Um, I've got one here that says, is it safe to use local estrogen in breast cancer survivors for vaginal atrophy? What do you think about that, Serge? Excellent question. Um, well, actually, I think the, 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 the short answer is, is no, but we must, and, and it's out of label, but we must admit that in some cases we prescribe estriol rather than estradiol because it's a weak estrogen and it's not transformed to estradiol. And we do so in some patients, but we try first non-hormonal therapy for vaginal atrophy 
So that is what we do. I don't know what's, and we try also uh, um, moistures, for instance, uh, first of all. I don't know what you experience in that. Uh, much the same in Australia. We would normally recommend using non-hormonal treatments first, but if a hormonal treatment had to be used, then we would normally use estriol. Um, the North American Menopause Society have just put out a recent position yeah. statement on this, and they said exactly the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, let's have a look at other question. Uh, Someone thank us, that's very nice. That's good. Are you able to comment today on data on dementia? I believe that was the question. Difficult question. What do you think about dementia and, and menopause and dementia and menopause hormone therapy? First of all, I don't think it should be used as a treatment for dementia. Agree. I, Agree. Think, <clears throat> I think uh, there's a reasonable amount of short term studies amongst women going through the menopause transition, which suggests that hormone therapy may have some beneficial effect on some components of cognitive function. Um, the Women's Health Initiative uh, memory study uh, overall showed harm when it was initiated in women who were over the age of 65, I think, but they had a subgroup looking at women in their 50s and they found that it made no difference to cognitive function. So my answer would be, it's not gonna make it worse as long as you're initiating therapy around the time of the menopause. It may help with some, uh, you know, people say they have a memory block or brain fog, which I think is often because they have hot flushes. And yeah. if you can alleviate the flushes, those symptoms go away, but it's not a treatment for a dementia. I, I agree totally. I have a colleague of mine, a very good friend, and she complains about concentration problems, know that she's menopause. And um, I told exactly what you said about, about the data, about there are no strong data, it's not an indication. And I said, let's be pragmatic, try it mm. and see if it helps. And if it helps, fine. If it doesn't help, stop it. So it's a very pragmatic answer, but we are out yeah. of label, clearly. Okay. What is your opinion about Tibolone? Ask someone. Um, Tibolone, actually, I think Tibolone is quite a good product. Yeah. Um, it's been around forever. Um, um, it is, I guess it is similar to a low dose form of hormone therapy. Um, it alleviates menopausal symptoms. It uh, improves bone density. It's been shown to reduce fracture. It doesn't seem to change breast density very much, so it's quite useful for women who have dense breasts. There are two buts. Yeah. There are two yes. buts. Well, just an anecdote, Tibolone was first sought as a contraceptive. That's not, yes. that's an anecdote, OD14 at that time. Yeah, but I remember it, that. Yeah. And they didn't push it as a contraceptive because it lowered HDL. Yeah. And so it has not, not a, a perfect, not a fantastic profile on cholesterol and lipids. And that was the reason why they didn't, uh, they, it, it stayed in the drawers for, for 30 years. For a long before, time. For yeah. long times. <clears throat> and it was also stopped in one trial of uh, the, in the paper of the New England, uh, where it was used for osteoporosis fracture, but it was stopped prematurely because of strokes. That's right. So in so in elderly patients, you should be aware of that because there, there is an increased risk of stroke, and it has not the best profile for lipids. But for the rest, I agree with what Rod just said. It has a good uh, a bleeding profile. And that's quite also. right. The lift yeah. the lift study, I think it showed uh, yeah. an increase in stroke. Yeah, <clears throat> the lift study exactly. Mm -hmm. So that was about. Okay, what about uh, levonorgestrel IUD for endometrial protection? I suppose in conjunction with estrogen therapy. Do you have experience? Yes, there is another question also about that. Well, look, yeah, I mean, in, we're very lucky in Australia because it's a subsidized medicine in Australia. So levonorgestrel IUDs are used quite a lot to treat uh, perimenopausal women for menstrual bleeding disorders and obviously for contraception as well. Um, and so, yes, 
um, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no particular data that looks at endometrial protection <clears throat> with menopausal hormone therapy, but we know it protects the endometrium in a normal menstrual cycle. So I think it's actually quite okay to use um, a levonorgestrel IUD as the progestogenic source, although in, voilà. it, it's still not as good as a natural progesterone, of course, in terms of uh, the other features. And I would not leave it in women with a breast cancer. No. Um, although it was studied and it was tried, they tried that to avoid uh, polyps for tamoxifen patients. But yeah. I would not because it's some, paper, some studies, two studies, I believe, Finnish study reported an increased risk. Not all studies reported that, but one Finnish study at least reported an increased risk of breast cancer also with levonorgestrel. IUDs. Yeah. So I would not yeah, leave it in right. breast cancer patients. Which goes back to that problem, which you very nicely demonstrated with that Frank, Frank Stanzik's diagram showing that those synthetic progestins bind to lots of other receptors. Yes. And that's really the big the nub of the problem, I think. What about phytoestrogens? That's a question. <clears throat> oh, the Cochrane Systematic Review says they don't work. That's, is that sufficient? Yeah, it's a pity for your money. Yes. That's what I answer my patient. I mean, I mean, if it doesn't work and we don't know if it doesn't harm, it's at least we know it's it's a pity for your money. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that would be my answer. Okay. Um, pom, pom. I think we should start closing because yeah. uh, I think many, we answered most of the questions and at this time, my pleasure to, to thank Rod first, to thank also the ISG and uh, Andrea Genazani and David Genazani, and of course to thank, thank Milan because they allowed us to do this uh, presentation, to have to, to this presentation, and to invite you also to attend a next presentation, which I normally should appear on your screen now, which is the menopause symptoms management facing needs and fears. It will be a presentation, fascinating presentations of two friends. Uh, Petra Stute and Nick Panay. So it's on 29th of October. Take your agenda, write it down, pencil it down at 3 p.m. again. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>